Hello, this is Carrie Phil. Welcome to my studio. Today's video starts with me winding a warp for the next project. So I'm winding off of two cones of natural colored four cell wool. This is uh, called four ply. I think it's UK wool. I love this stuff. It's soft as anything. It takes the dye beautifully. Today I'm starting a new project. I'm excited about it. Nikki wants a V cowl, custom dyed and made just for her. So, so I've already filmed uh, the winding of the warp in uh, the loom room and now I've brought it over here and it is soaking in some water with citric acid. And We're going to be dyeing this warp in Nikki's colors which are green, blue, and purple. So I've got, I've pulled out some dye stocks and the violet obviously will fit the bill for the purple. It's in a pickle jar. Um, I'm in the process of making sure that my dye stocks are in are in uh, consistent jars. This is still in one of my old jars. Does not smell like pickles. But it's a beautiful uh, violet, which is our purple. The blue, um, I'm going to try two different blues. So my flag blue and a bright blue. So far, bright blue is my favorite blue. Flag blue is a bit deeper, so this will give it a... Um, some depth to the colors. And for green, I have blue spruce and avocado. So, and I'm going to dye the warps in medium immersion in the steam pan. Three warps are in here. This is Nikki's warp right here on this side. There are two uh, white warp chains. And you notice I have them oriented opposite ways because I want the two warp chains to die up differently. And by lining up the two warp chains um, opposite to each other, a band of color will cross them at different places so that when I put them on the loom, the colors will be in different places on the warp and you'll see, we'll see uh, stripes. So we have fairly um, high immersion, medium immersion maybe. The colors will blend a little bit. I'm gonna put the heat on low. The water that I added is the acid water from the dye bath. The way I'm going to uh, mix up the yarn for dyeing is I'm just gonna take a tablespoon of the stock, add it to the measuring cup. So we've got a a uh, tablespoon of dye stock. I'm going to add some water to this and then I'm going to pour it over the yarn. I'm going to do that with each of the colors.
So this is interesting. This is uh, the flag blue, which definitely looks purple. Yep, it goes on as purple. So I'm going to trust that it's a flag blue and watch the color change. water is getting higher and higher in the pan and I'm good with that. To me that means uh, that the color will blend more and it won't all settle at the bottom and get give us some dark spots at the bottom. So that was the flag blue violet. Next. We've got two greens, a couple of blues. This isn't looking blue yet. Um, I think I'm going to add some more blue down at that end. Some more of the bright blue. So what I'm going to do now is let uh, this heat up and when the water starts to clear a bit I'll flip it around and see if there's any light areas that need uh, some more attention. I love this color scheme. I think it's going to look awesome. This is interesting. This is the, uh, the flag blue here and this is the violet here. So what I'm counting on is this purple once it uh, heats up uh, I'm counting on it to turn to turn blue I've used the flag blue once before and it was a blue so uh, let's see if that uh, if that stays consistent so it's been 10 minutes I haven't touched anything and we can see the water is clearing down at this end. Still very blue down at this end. Oh, look at the sediment. And so far, the flag blue is not turning blue. It's still purple. Strange. The green avocado, that is, has absorbed nicely. I love this blue. And the flag blue is purple. Come on, flag blue, 
show yourself. I'm going to lay some tin foil over this and that's going to keep the heat in and especially at this end. I want uh, more heat at this end so the blue will strike. I think that'll keep some of the heat in. This has been about 10 minutes since I last checked. I still have sediment down here. I don't know why. I'm going to flip everything. Maybe lower the heat a bit. But I'm not going to flip it end for end because I want the blue to stay down there. So I'm turning this upside down to see if there's any light spots. And there are. Right there. So the uh, flag blue doesn't look like it did much. The purple and the greens are looking wonderful. I'm going to top up some color. The flag blue looks purple, so we are going to add the blue in here. up some more. I'm just looking at the color scheme, trying to decide if there's anything else needed. I think I'm going to add some more green down here. a lovely green but I think I want a bit more of it. And a little bit more blue. I flipped the pan around since it seemed like more heat was happening here than here. This is the small burner and this is the large burner. So um, the green got lots of heat and so I turned the pan around so that this end um, is getting the heat too. So it looks like most of the water has cleared. There's a slight blue tinge here. Clear water down here. So I think if I just turn the heat off at this point and let everything cool down in the pan, uh, the yarn will absorb whatever's left in the water here. It's been a few hours. Everything is cool. Water is cold. Looks like the dye has all been absorbed into the yarn. Good. Looking beautiful. A nice, beautiful blend of blue, purple, and green. And it looks like the bright green has dyed into a nice darker variegated color. Lovely. So now I'm going to rinse out this yarn and hang it to dry. So here's the dyed warp for Nikki's v -Kel. There's three chains here 
all chained together. And we have a good variety of blues, greens, and purples. And there will be all three colors changing places consistently down the length of the work. So now it's ready to put on the loom. Now I'm threading my loom. I'm uh, pulling the threads through the heddle, both the slots and the holes. If I was just working straight off of balls or cones, I would probably direct warp my loom. But because I pre-wound these warps for dyeing, I'm indirect warping. I have three warp chains here. I have a cross preserved by uh, tying a loop through it. You can see the white yarn there. That's preserving my cross. And I'm taking them in order and threading them according to a pattern that I have worked out ahead of time. I'm taking them from the different warp chains as I need them. The two main warp chains are now threaded and I'm going in now with the narrow green chain and filling in the little gaps that I had left on my first pass. This is the narrow little chain that you saw in the dye pan that I uh, didn't mention. It was a bright green yarn that I didn't really care for. It was a little too bright. And so I had thrown it in the pan along with the others, hoping to over dye it and giving it some more depth and, and nuance in the color. And this narrow warp chain is being interspersed uh, among the warp and gives us a, a few little stripes that uh, separate out some of the colors and add some more interest. I'm always careful to tie loose knots behind the heddle uh, every 10 or 20 yarn threads just uh, to stop the whole thing from sliding back out or in case I knock the heddle down I don't lose all the threading that I've done. And now I'm tying all the yarn to the bar at the back and it's in preparation to be wound onto the loom. I tie in about one inch bundles. I'm all uh, threaded and tied onto the back beam here. So now I need to roll it on. And I use uh, cheap placemats from the dollar store as my packing. So I just hold the warp under tension here at the front, have it held firmly uh, while I wind onto the back beam with the other hand. Nice uh, little loom so it's easy to do it all by myself. So I'm just going to keep Just keep winding on, adding more paper packing. More placemat packing as I go. Until the entire warp is wound on. I don't have a skein winder, but I have a swift. So I'm just going to go like this with my finger. I have the yarn here. It's uh, on the cone on the floor and I'm just hanging on with one hand and winding it onto my swift with the other. I figure I need 110 times around to give me the right amount for the weft for this piece. I see that 
I'm going to need to in either invest in a skein winder or uh, start buying uh, bulk skeins of yarn so I can just ha throw a skein in the pot to dye. I have that in lace weight yarn right now, but not in this weight, so. So a skein winder would actually uh, count the number of revolutions, and so you'd be able to keep track of how much uh, yarn the yardage is. But I'm not at that point yet, I guess. So here's a bank of yarn, which will be my weft. Put the, the plastic uh, loop on it, a shower curtain, and it is ready to go into the dye pot. So there's the blue. What do we think? Is that enough pigment? I can't decide whether to throw some other blues in there. The reason why I'm mixing blues is some are going to strike sooner than others and in different places on the yarn and I think it'll give it an interesting look so that the the yarn will vary down the the length of the skein. So I'm also going to stick in a tablespoon of the bright blue, which is in the warp as well. So this should bring it all together. So three different blues in here, which should make an exciting color scheme. So it's heating nicely. It's not a, a boil yet, but I'm going to add this in. Look at that blue. It's gorgeous. It took the color quickly. It's going to be deep, dark color. Okay, it's been about 15 minutes. And, ooh, it's a dark blue. I like it. We still have some color in the water. So I'm going to let this keep absorbing the dye. I don't know if you can see the, the water is starting to clear. But I put a lot of pigment in here. So I find dark colors uh, tend to make the colors in the warp uh, pop. They really bring, let it shine. So. I definitely did want it to be dark and it will dry a little lighter than this because uh, it's wet it always looks darker when wet so okay after another 10 minutes or so uh, the water has, still has lots of uh, dye in it this has been steaming uh, for quite a while I think I oversaturated the the pot and there's probably too much dye in there for the amount of yarn so I don't know where that we're just going to take it out look at that nice deep color it's a beautiful blue but I'm not going to leave it in there to uh, try to absorb the rest of the dye we're gonna take it out oops sorry for the steam in the meantime, we've got this lovely skein of very dark blue, which does look like it has some variation in it. Lovely! So here's the dyed weft. It's a beautiful color. And I think that it is going to go well with the warp. It's going to set it off beautifully. A uh, deep color always looks better and makes the uh, bright colored warp pop. So this is going to work just right. So I'll go put it on my swift and wind it into a bow in preparation for being wound onto a shuttle. 
I did all that winding off camera and I've just jumped right into the weaving here. This is a plain weave structure, meaning that the weft is going over one and under one, uh, alternating through the entire piece. And this weave structure is where the rigid heddle loom shines. The colors are working out well because I laid the warp chains in the dye pan um, and opposite to each other. The colors are showing up in different places, so uh, the color changes are always giving us uh, these multicolored stripes down the length. After a few hours of just this straight weaving, I removed it from the loom and reattached it for the next part of the weaving process. So I have uh, removed the woven part from the loom and reattached it uh, so that this end is loose and now I'm weaving it back into this is the loose end and I'm weaving it back into uh, the scarf into the part that's already been woven to make a complete loop. Now this part that I'm making here is going to be that uh, beautiful V shape that you see uh, at the front of the V cowl and it ends up in a, a plaid pattern because of the stripes in the warp that come around and then cross over and, uh, and make this interesting plaid pattern at the front. These here are the ends, which I then twist, and they are the decorative fringe that you see at the front. So I feed the ends through one at a time, and put them into place. So I didn't record in this video exactly how I reattached the scarf back to the front of the loom in order to have this end free. Uh, I do show that in another one of my videos. It's called uh, Weaving a V Cowl, All the Important Bits. And I'll have a link to that in the um, iCard right up here. And that's a... Uh, a video that uh, shows how to reattach and also um, all the little tips uh, for weaving these parts, uh, this this part here back in. If, uh, if anybody's interested in trying to recreate something similar I also have another video which is about twisting fringes by hand and it's a short little three minute one and I'll also link to that above and just uh, explains what I'm I'm doing here. I do have a little fringe twister contraption but I prefer to do it by hand. I put on a good Netflix show and uh, twist away. So I've done the uh, the twisting on both edges. I can now remove the tape. It's painter's tape, so it comes off easily. And now the V cowl is ready for the wet finishing.
it's soaked, full of, and full of soap. So now, this is wool, but you don't baby wool in the wet finishing. You actually want the web to close up and tighten, so you want fulling to happen. So in that case, you do a bit of beating on it. we're doing is we're turning this web that you can see through into a cloth. So we want those holes to close up. I'm speeding up the footage here. I decided not to cut it out entirely because I wanted to show how much agitation and beating this will will take. You may have heard of walking the wool, and that's basically what this is. It's a combination of water, heat, and um, pounding, basically, um, in order to turn uh, the woven web into a finished fabric. And I like the looks of that. So I'm going to rinse out this cowl and uh, wash, rinse all the soap out of it and then I'll press it and trim the fringe to make it look pretty all over again. So I've rinsed it out, uh, rinsed all the soap out and now I'm going to wrap it in a towel and squeeze uh, the extra water out and then I'm going to hang it to dry. I should also say that this wet finishing is done as part of the uh, creating the item process. And now that that rough handling wet finishing has happened, now you have to take care with the wool item to not create any more fulling or felting in future washes. So in the future, uh, you hand wash in cold water with very little agitation and lay it out flat to dry. So the washing from now on is a very gentle process. So the cowl is dry and we have a beautiful cloth that is soft and warm and colorful. It has closed up the weave is not as see-through as it was before the washing, so it's become cloth. And now uh, we're going to press it. There's a lot. There's some creases and some bumps and textures. So the final process in wet finishing is to press the cloth. So after washing, the ends are long and messy, so I cut them off so they're neat again. The final stage is to sew on my label. So here is Nikki's finished bee cowl. It is 100% wool and hand dyed in blues, greens, and purples. It has the 2x2 two two striping which is a unique look that comes from the way I wind the warp and then dye it. it. has fringes 
on the bottom two sides where the ends come together. This uh, is a one piece, which has then been looped around the neck. This is where the two ends of the work come together and weave into themselves. And it gives a unique sort of plaid pattern at the front. So this turned out beautifully. Nikki, I hope you love it as much as I do. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel. And please consider becoming a patron. Thank you for watching.